season to those present, those reading the service, and those joining online later. May this church be a space where each one of us feels safe and respected, a part of God's family. God created and cherishes our diversity in age, gender, sexual orientation, body build, health, and history. As we pray, work, sing, lament, and celebrate, we do so as equal members of God's beloved kingdom. May this time be a sacred hour of community with God and one another. So, you guys are always a busy pastoral charge with lots of announcements. It's exciting to me. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Shannon Duffesemont. I'm a licensed lay worship leader. I come from Lavac. And uh, today we pray for the First Wesley United Church in Thunder Bay and Bar River United Church in Echo Bay. There will be refreshments downstairs after the service or lemonade on the lawn with that smoke, I'm guessing, downstairs. <laughs> Uh, there are still a few camping spots open at Camp McDougall, and the information is online for you. Bread and Roses Food Bank is the third Thursday of each month from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. Now next week, on June 27th, the council meeting has been cancelled. Call the Chair Charlotte if there is any urgent business to be discussed. June is Indigenous History Month and Pride Month. We are invited to learn, prayerfully reflect, and seek opportunities for advocacy and solidarity. Um, the Regional Council is actually circulating a newsletter, an Indigenous History Month newsletter, every week. And uh, if you want to talk to your representative to Council, they can probably forward you that. Saturday, July 1st at 1 p.m., Bill Freeland Celebration of Life is happening at the Cape Real Cross Country Ski Club. On Wednesday, July 5th, there's an ecumenical worship service at Coulson Port at 1.30 p.m. Friends are welcome. And looking further ahead, on July 15th, will be Pride in the Park in Sudbury. So watch for details. This, this pastoral charge will be a presence there. We pray for our pastor, Pam, as she studies at the Atlantic School of Theology. Pastoral care coverage has been arranged, and our church phone message machine is being checked in. We gather for worship on land where Indigenous people have lived for thousands of years. This church is located on the traditional territory of the Wanapibi Anishinaabe. We lament the damage <coughs> that European colonization has had on First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. And we acknowledge that many Indigenous people still today live with intergenerational trauma, racism, and inequity. All who live in this area are parties to the Robinson-Huron Treaty, which outlines the shared rights and responsibilities connected to the care and use of the land. As a covenant people, we are called to honor promises. As a church, we have been called to a journey of learning, reconciliation, and reparation. We are called to love our neighbors. May God support and bless our commitment to live out these calls. We light this Christ can candle as a symbol of Christ's presence here with us today. But Christ is not just here in this place. Christ is with us always, wherever we go. May our lives be a faithful reflection of the one we follow. Our call to worship this morning is responsive. What is that? Can you hear it? Hear what? A call? It's really faint. I, I can't quite make it out. <coughs> What's that? Can you feel it? Feel what? It's, it's like a nudge <coughs> or a push. We, we hear a nudge. We hear a call. But, but it's faint. faint. We yeah. can't quite yeah. understand it. We are called together in this place to worship and explore. That's a great place to start. We are gathered together. Let us worship and celebrate as the branches of the one bond. Holy mystery, there is no other whom we love more than you. In loving you and being loved by you, we see clearly our mission to love one another. Divine Creator, there is no other whom we would place before you. 
and put in your mission first, we find purpose for our lives. We find purpose for our church. When we grow weary, our conviction to live by faith enables us to stay the course. When we are successful, we are resplendent in your glory. In gratitude, in lament, we are yours. You raised us from sin, washed clean and filled with hope. Your grace as unconditional as your love. In our stillness, we feel the presence and guidance of the Holy Spirit. In our spirit-guided actions, we emulate the actions of Christ. We are grateful for the path you have provided for us. We are grateful for the Trinity that guides us to this path and helps us to continue on the way. Holy mystery, who is holy love, we praise your name. We offer praises to you. We offer thanksgiving for your beautiful creation. We give you thanks for your mercy, your grace, your boundless love. Just as your love knows no bounds, let our love for you be unconditional too. We pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. And our opening hymn today is from More Voices, number 12, Come Touch Our Hearts. Understand. 
as Hagar cast out and waiting for the elements to take her son did not understand God's greater plan, we too cannot divine our full purpose. We will continue to learn to listen for those calls, feel those nudges, and our relationship with the great, great teacher will help us to decipher them. We may falter, but we will move ever forward in the loving embrace of God, working toward the kingdom. All things are possible through God who gives us strength. God who never falters. Let us share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Now I believe I see a young one today. Would you like to come up to the front for an all ages time? So, we have you ever been, well, what's this first of all? It's a water bottle. Now your generation has the amazingly good fortune that your mom will carry something like this everywhere she goes for you. Just like sunblock. But maybe when the rest of us were kids, you know, you took a quick drink out of the hose and went back to play, and you might have spent more time than you wanted to dehydrated. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to read about a little later today is when Hagar and Ishmael went out into the wilderness and all they had was just one skin filled with water, just one water bottle for two people, for days and days. Now, have you ever been thirsty? Yeah, anybody out there ever been really thirsty? Mm -hmm. Throat scratchy, tongue starting to get thick and dry, the heat, you're sweating, and oh God, you wish you could drink your sweat sometimes. <laughs> and it's really, really an uncomfortable feeling. And I hope nobody here has ever gotten to the point where that feeling is frightening. Because when that feeling gets frightening, that means you might not find something to drink. And that can be very, very dire. So, an angel came to Hagar and showed her how to find water for her and Ishmael. How do you think that felt? Yes, Allison's got it. Oh my goodness, water, praise God, water, we can live. Honestly, for them, it was to live. So, finding that wealth, tasting that water, it's a great analogy to our faith. Our faith can keep us hydrated, our faith can keep us going through the darkest times, through the most barren times, through the driest times, through the loneliest times. Okay, as long as we have our faith and we have our communities, we're linked and we can move forward with God. Now, I believe we have a hymn to sing together. Walk with me.
Creator God, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now this is our time for a shout out for local thanks. Does anyone have something they are thankful for or something to celebrate? Oh, beautiful. Yes. Birthdays, anniversaries. I'm thankful I'm getting my surgery in less than two weeks. <laughs> fluently, in Uninactum frequently, sorry. These days, most of us have access to technology that allows us to learn the world's common languages, but countless languages, including many indigenous languages, can only be learned from their few remaining speakers. Revitalizing a lost language, as one of our partners in Nunavut is doing, is an important way to preserve not just the language, but also the culture that surrounds it. The Inanunaptun language is the cultural foundation of the Inanayak people who live in the central Canadian Arctic. The literal meaning of the word Inanunaptun is to be like an Inanuat, a person. Today, fewer than 600 people can still speak the language fluently. Many lost the language when they were removed from their communities and sent to residential schools. Pitkihurnikat Ilratinik Kitty Mayak's Heritage Society in Cambridge Bay, none of it, is working hard to keep Inanunaktun alive. One-on-one -on -one language immersion sessions with mentors inspire reconnection. Through everyday conversations at home and on the land, Mentorship is helping to heal the wounds of systematic oppression. In partnership with Mission and Service, in the Nunaktan language mentors get resources to allow them to spend 300 hours a year working with their apprentices to begin to restore the language. Your gifts to Mission and Service help partners continue to restore language and culture. Thank you. As a blessed people, we are called to be a blessing. Let us bless our church and the wider world with our offerings of time, talent, and tithes. And we can join together in the prayer of dedication. All that we have is from you, Creator. With these gifts we seek to be like you, creating a world where love is known. Sharing the goodness of beauty and kindness, blessing our neighbors with our faith in action. Bless these gifts and may they be a sign of our co creating ministry in your name. Amen. Under Him from Voices United, number 567, will you come and follow me?
word of God. I'm reading Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21 from the New International Version. Hagar and Ishmael sent away. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking, and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a great nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. And she went, and sat, she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And she sat there, and she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. And the next reading is from Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 through 39, from the voice translation. A student is no greater than his teacher, and a servant is never greater than his master. It is sufficient if the student is like the teacher and the servant is like his master. If people call the head of a house Beelzebul, which means devil, just imagine what they're calling the members of the household. Do not be afraid of those who may taunt or persecute you. Everything they do, even if they think they're hiding behind closed doors, will come to light. All their secrets will eventually be made known. And you should proclaim in the bright light of day everything that I have whispered to you in the dark. Whatever whispers you hear, shout them from the rooftops of your houses. Don't fear those who aim to kill just the body, but are unable to touch the soul. The one to fear is he who can destroy you, soul and body, in the fires of hell. Look, if you sold a few sparrows, how much money would you get? A copper coin apiece, perhaps? And yet your Father in heaven knows when those small sparrows fall to the ground. You, beloved, are worth so much more than a flock of sparrows, a whole flock. God knows everything about you, even the number of hairs on your head. So do not fear. Whoever knows me here on earth, I will know him on heaven. And whoever proclaims faith in me here on earth, I will proclaim faith in him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me here, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not imagine that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to turn men against their fathers, daughters against their mothers, and daughters-in-law against their mothers-in-law. You will find you have enemies even in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, then you are not worthy of me. If you love your son or daughter more than you love me, then you are not worthy of me. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me on the narrow road, then you are not worthy of me. To find your life, you must lose your life. And whoever loses his life for my sake 
will find it. For this reading from Scripture, thanks be to God, and by God's grace we hear a living word in it. Amen. to retrospection. Some of these times are introspective, where we look inward for guidance, answers, or evaluation. Some of these times are contemplative of the many influences that have shaped a situation or an outcome. When we're young, we're often focused on the immediate. We are, by our very circumstances, short-sighted. It's not our fault, really. We are lacking in the experience that gives a broader perspective. We see a stitch in time instead of the woven tapestry, one part of the thread, one section of the weave. The contributors to Gallery Magazine for this Sunday suggested that we imagine ourselves as Hagar, not at the moment where she was cast out by Abraham, but towards the end of her life, a time when age had given her a broader perspective. A time when experience had granted her wisdom. A time when the tapestry of her life, woven by God, is apparent to her in its infinitely complex form, and during its completion. When she can look back over her life and see how the different elements came together to shape the path that God had planned for her. Put yourself in Hagar's position. Perhaps you're sitting in the afternoon sun, talking with your daughter-in-law as you watch your grandchildren playing in front of your dwelling place. You watch quietly as they run and laugh, tease each other, and engage with the world all around them. And your mind drifts to a time when your son, Ishmael, teased and played with his half-brother Isaac. Your daughter-in-law notices your faraway look, and she observes you kindly. And after watching you for a while, she asks, What are you thinking of, Mother, that has you in another place? You smile slowly and you look at her. I am thinking of a great curse that was actually a great gift that came to pass a lifetime ago. She looks at you puzzled, waiting for more. And so you tell her your story, how you and Ishmael came to live in the wilderness of Prague how you came to build this life for yourselves. I was given to Abraham by Sarah so that he could have an heir. That was the way of things. But it was an honor too, a chance for my child to have a good life a good future, and experience things that my child might otherwise be denied. I conceived Abraham's child. It was a beautiful gift and I was so happy. Our places were assured in the household. Our future is now written, or so I thought. God gave to Sarah a child in her old age, a promise to Abraham of as Sarah's womb fulfilled. The entire household was so happy a great gift for Abraham was a gift for us all. We were awestruck by the wonder of God's power and promise, at God's faithfulness. We were filled to the bursting with our own faith, and we gave thanks to God, praised the divine creator, carried the love of the holy ones in our heart throughout all of our daily tasks and our daily interactions. I was so happy, so wrapped up in the joy of my faith, that I didn't even stop to think about what the appearance of a legitimate heir would be for my own son. There was a great celebration. I, I remember it well. Isaac had been weaned, and Abraham gave an extraordinary feast. We were a family then. I was so sure of our places in Abraham and Sarah's household, and so filled with joy that we were all caught up in, I failed to see Sarah's jealousy until it was too late. The kids, they were just playing, her son and mine, both sons of Abraham. 
laughing and teasing as boys do, much like your kids are doing now. My heart was overflowing with love for them and gratitude for this life that we had been given. I was blindsided when Abraham came to me the next morning. I was in shock. I, I didn't really understand when he first handed me food and water. Did, did he want me to go fetch something or undertake a journey? I, I was so confused. And then the look on his face, it, it was like sorrow mixed with hope cemented by grim determination. When he put Ishmael on my back, where could we be going with some food and a leather bag full of water? He just sent us away with no place to go. I was worried sick, a slave with no household and a child to raise? Where could we go? I was angry and I was sad. I felt abandoned. I had been abandoned by Abraham with no explanation. Just take some food and go, start a new life, find a new home. How can I make sure that Ishmael will be safe and healthy and provided for? And when the water ran out, I thought my heart would break. How could I hold my son and watch him die? The anguish I felt caused me to bend double. I couldn't let him see the fear, the pain. He couldn't know the trouble we were in. And so I set him under a tree and I walked away. And there out of sight I cried. And from where I sat, I could still hear Ishmael crying. He was so thirsty and I'm sure he was scared. An unknown place, none of the people he loved near him but me and even I had to walk away. How it hurt to watch him suffer, and I cursed Abraham in my heart and Sarah and the world we lived in that could allow this to happen. I felt powerless, alone, and afraid. I was hopeless. In the wilderness with no water left and none in sight, I turned away from Ishmael. I could still hear him crying, and I knew that he was suffering, but I could not watch him die. I had failed him, failed to protect him. I was helpless. We were helpless. How our fortunes had changed, just like that. I didn't know it then, in that moment of deepest despair that our fortunes were about to change again. The sound of hope reborn, an angel's voice. I can see the way that you're looking at me, and yes, I mean a literal angel. An emissary from God, from heaven on high. I'm shocked. I still had my faith, but I never expected to hear an angel's voice in the wilderness. You would think it would have been comforting, but when the angel asked why I was troubled, a few ungracious thoughts ran through my head. But then I grasped the meaning of the rest of his words. My son was going to live, and I was so grateful. When I opened my eyes and saw the newly sprung well, I was overwhelmed with joy. Starting over, though, that, that was hard. I grieved for my old life, even as I was grateful for the new and God's promise for the future and for my family's future. Everything was unfamiliar. The wilderness was harsh at times, but we made it and look at the life that we have now. Looking back, I can see that this was God's plan all along. I didn't know it at the time, but I can see it now. Funny story, isn't it, when you think about it that way? There are a lot of elements that we could dissect, some very cultural things that we might react to, like slavery or sexism or the endangerment of a child. Our society is different from the one in which Hagar and Ishmael live. We exist in a different time in a different place. It wasn't Hagar with whom God shared the plan for her son, but with Abraham. And God shared with Abraham a plan for his descendants. Hagar was sent out into the world by Abraham at Sarah's urging. Because of Abraham's talk with God, we know that God had a plan for Ishmael. As followers of the way in modern times, we can recognize that God had a plan for Hagar and Ishmael's future wife and all of their children as well. Let's not focus on the cultural differences. Let's focus instead on what Hagar's story can teach us about faith, about perspective, about the great weaver who is eternal and sees all things. I imagine that as Hagar looked back in her twilight years over her life, 
She could see the pieces and how they fit together for God's perfect purpose a lot more clearly. When she was cast out of Abraham's household along with her vulnerable son, she was likely confused and terrified. We hear in the telling that she truly believed her son was going to die. We know that people die. The death of a loved one does not stop us from having faith. Death is sometimes a part of God's plan, and it's not always avoided because it causes pain or discomfort. We don't really get to see the state of Hagar's faith, and we don't really get to know her well at all. But we put ourselves in her place today, and we can imagine doubt, fear, worry, confusion, sadness, joy, the bittersweet pain of starting over especially when she had no way of knowing what that end game was. She had no way to see the bigger picture when she was standing in the moment. And even after the angel told her that God would make a great nation out of Ishmael's descendants, it would have been a foreign entity to her. This wasn't her homeland of Egypt. This wasn't Cana or the household with which she had become familiar. Her role had changed. Her life had changed. Wandering in the wilderness, settling in Paran, whether alone or finding others, it was a loss as well as an opportunity, events that would lead to both grief and hope. We have been where Hagar was at some point in all of our lives, a time when we really didn't understand the purpose of our trials, a time when we couldn't see the way through. Perhaps it wasn't life or death like it was for Hagar. Think of a time when you suffered, Think of a time where you couldn't imagine a shining light in a life of peace. And perhaps your faith faltered or seemed to be lost completely. Perhaps you maintained your faith but begged God to just show you the way through or tell you the reason why you suffered or were lost. Perhaps you clung to your faith for dear life and weathered the storm. Depression, the illness of a child, caring for a spouse or a parent with dementia or critical illness, losing a job, losing your way, addiction, the list is endless and part of the human condition. Just because we are a part of the church and because we nurture our relationship with God does not mean that we will never know suffering or pain. God is holy mystery who is holy love, and we will never understand the vastness of divine mercy or the complexity of the divine plan. The good news is that with time and distance come perspective and wisdom. At the end of Hagar's story, I imagine she said, looking back, I can see this was God's plan all along. I didn't know it at the time, but I can see it now, and I believe it. After all, the Bible goes on to tell us that God had been with her son as he grew up, as he became a skillful hunter. We are told that his mother had found him a wife. Perhaps in the choosing of an Egyptian wife, we can see a merging of nations, a broadening of God's church, or perhaps the interpretation is that the story has come full circle, as Hagar herself is an Egyptian. One thing we see for certain in the Bible's telling is that Ishmael had everything he needed in life. God was with him. He had faith, that which makes all things possible. He was a skillful hunter. He could provide sustenance for himself and his future family. He had a wife, fulfilling God's promise of children and giving him a fuller life. He had a mother who was part of his life and his growth. There is no denying that Hagar and Ishmael went through a terrible ordeal. There is no denying that Hagar must have experienced some very intense negative emotions when they were cast out and again when the water ran out. But they got a new life out of it. Looking back, I believe Hagar, while maybe not fully understanding God's plan, would see that this is how it ought to be. That she and Ishmael had been cast out to grow and thrive as their own nation. I think as her family grew, and she became comfortable in her new life, she would have gained far better perspective of God's purpose. I know of a few people who have found their purpose through pain, who could not have become what they have become without suffering. It is often the most challenging times that shape and define us. 
As some people are fond of saying, God never gives us more than we can handle. But when we're in the middle of it, it can be very hard to see the forest for the trees. And perspective is something that we can rarely gain when we're in the midst of a situation. There's a reason for that saying that hindsight is 2020. I had a friend who strongly believed in God as creator and divine planner, and he truly believed that everything happened for a reason. And let me tell you, he'd been through some things in his life. And when things were tough, he used to say, really God, this is where you need me to be right now? And then he'd say, okay. And he would plow through and he would trust that God was using that moment or that relationship to shape him or to shape those other people around him and that it would all come together in the end as God had intended. I look back on my life sometimes and I find it so much easier to see God at work the more time passes. Sometimes it's really simple in short term. My thoughts are guided in a, what seems like an unproductive and really unpleasant direction. And I really can't figure out why until I sit down to craft the sermon and realize that clever, clever God. <laughs> I needed to dwell on those things to really understand that the word was speaking to me through my own memories, through my own experiences, and it becomes much more clear when I sit down to pull things together. And sometimes it's more long term, like how I came to become a worship leader. The interactions that seemed to be very small at the time, but led me quite steadily to this place over a period of years. The often painful experiences that taught me compassion, accommodation and inclusion. The people that taught me about unconditional love. We will never fully understand God's purpose for us. There is a reason that God is described in the Song of Faith as holy mystery, who is holy love. And that's okay. We will have joy and we will have pain. We will love and we will lose. And it is all part of that greater purpose. God walks along beside us and I for one invite the Creator to take my life and use it. Why can the nations of the world not forget their differences? We pray for a peace that lasts between Russia and Ukraine. We pay, pray for a peace that lasts in the divided countries of Syria and Sudan. Why can the powerless in our communities not find support? We pray for the homeless and those without the resources, without resources are able to speak out. We pray for those who use emergency shelters and the food banks of this region. We pray for those who go the hard route of lobbying the elected representatives. We pray for those who protest without violence. Christ stands beside the hopeless and the war scarred innocent. Christ stands beside those who support the powerless. Where does our Christian approach lead us? To be a follower of Jesus is a tough calling. We will take the rough with the smooth. Why can the sick and the well not be treated equally? We pray for an equal distribution of health resources in this nation. We pray for creative ways to diagnose and treat those in remote areas. We pray for those in constant pain and for those who are dying. We pray for family members who constantly care for the chronically sick. We pray for family counselors who hear the heartbreaking experiences of women, men, and children and we pray for grief counselors who enter the empty places of those who have lost loved ones. Christ stands with the sick, the confused, those who have suffered loss, and those who feel alone. And Christ stands with those who are especially on our hearts and our minds today. What does the Christian faith call us to do? To be a follower of Jesus is a tough calling and we will take the rough with the smooth. Why is it so hard for the values of Jesus Christ promoted by the church to find acceptance? 
We pray for faith community members who insist that local congregations raise justice issues. We pray for those who have suffered because they advocate gay rights and sanctuary for the oppressed within the church. We pray for those who welcome persons who are ignored by polite society into the church. We pray for those who promote the questioning and critical study of Christian belief and scriptures in the local church. We pray for those who affirm that promoting spiritual values is a priority in a materialistic society. We pray for those who see the local church as a small but vital part of the body of Christ worldwide. To be a follower of Jesus is a tough calling and we will take the rough with the smooth. Why is it so difficult to be numbered among Christ's followers? We ask for the will to venture out when it's easier to stay close to home. We ask for a good friend to support us when we go against the stream, a friend unafraid to tell it like it is. We pray for the courage to speak the truth when it's easier to evade the issue, and we pray for patient endurance in the face of criticism. Christ stands with those who take the uncomfortable, risky, but faithful road. Will our Christian discipleship lead us through difficulty and opposition to a life that satisfies spirit, heart, and mind? To be a follower of Jesus is a tough calling, but we will take the rough with the smooth. Our closing hymn today is from Voices United, number 559, Come, O Font of Every Blessing.